and gentlemen, Brigadier General jo Welsh entered the United States Air Force in June 1976 as a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He has commanded a fighter squadron, a fighter group, and a fighter wing. While commanding the 4th Tactical Fighter Squadron, Hill Air Force Base, Utah, he was responsible for the squadron's combat operations during Operation Desert Storm. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Welsh. Room, tent hut. Thanks, folks. Sit down. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate it, man. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for volunteering to come over. And thanks to all you three degrees and dualies tuning in at home. You guys, if you haven't, don't remember what it's like in that TV, I just saw this TV broadcast feed for the first time. I'm about this big to the class of 2002 and 2003, which is about right. But it's good to have you guys listening in. I know none of you are lying on the rack listening to this. <laughs> because I know none of you did that. <laughs> Let me say thanks to a couple of people for showing up today. Someone out here I think is General Waggy. There he is, right here. General Dave Waggy, the your dean. <laughs> Now, there's a rule of engagement General Waggy's got to learn now in my wing. When they cheer for you, you've got to flex. So let's try that one more time. There we go. <laughs> yeah. General Waggy and the faculty just came out. I don't know if you saw the recent uh, magazine article saying that this was the, the USAFA was the best academic experience in America, according to a poll of students. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool stuff. Right next to General Waggy is a uh, real warfighter. He's going to understand what I'm talking about today. The Vice Wing Commander of the 34th Training Wing, Colonel Trapper Carpenter. <laughs> a little bit behind him is Chief Rich Harold, Senior Enlisted Advisor, or Command Chief Master Sergeant for our wing. Right next to him is Lieutenant Colonel Corky, Colonel Select Corky Von Kessel, the superintendent's exec, who somehow Colonel Carpenter has let sneak in behind him for an unobserved shot at six. But Corky, thanks for coming over, bud. And then we have Chaplain Pat Nicholson, our senior Catholic cadet chaplain here, who is a wonderful guy, a great priest, and a prodigious American. Father Pat, it's great to have you here, bud. Well, George's not here, is he? Well, where's Brian at? Hey, Brian. I apologize. The Vice Superintendent, Colonel Brian Venn, right here in the middle of the room. Geez, when the boss is gone, he's in charge. I'm sorry, Brian. I wish Colonel Jordan was here because I got the beak at Colonel Jordan. And I was going to kind of ask him about something. Today. I had to get rid of a perfectly good hunting dog this week. Those of you who know me probably know I really love my dog. He may, be the, may have been the best bird dog in America. Earlier this summer, I asked Colonel Jordan to come hunting with me and the dog. The dog's named Sarge, by the way. I asked him to come hunting with us for a week. And Dan really had a trouble getting this straight the entire week. I don't know if he was intimidated by rank or what, but he called this dumb dog General. <laughs> Which I thought was funny until about a week later when I realized that my dog had been ruined. Because after a week of being called general, all that stupid mud will do is sit on his ass and bark. <laughs> okay, let me tell you why you're really here today. <laughs> this is the first of the Commandant's Leadership Series for the academic year 9900. The guys in the education group. Thank you. <laughs> the guys in the education group who put this together, particularly Captain Brian Anderson, who does the, the lion's share of the work doing this, came to me with a game plan that I turned off too, too soon before this event for them to find a better speaker. So you're stuck with me for the first one. Let me tell you what we want to do with this series during the course of the year. I'm wearing this for a reason. The Commandant's Leadership Series during this academic year is going to talk about why the United States Air Force exists. Each and every one of you is going to have a role when you leave here 
that causes you to directly or indirectly support the generation of combat sorties. I don't care if you're a security forces officer, an intel officer, a civil engineer, or a fighter pilot, your job is to generate combat sorties and to win the nation's wars. Period. It's an easy mission statement. We kick butt for a living. And you're part of it. So buy in now if you want to come out and work at my Air Force. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the view from the cockpit. We're going to talk about the view from the ground. We're going to talk about combat operations. And today's the first in that effort. Not long ago, matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, on August 2nd, the Air Force Times printed a little article inside the front cover that talked about a survey they'd run. Here it is right here. This is all the notes I have. The Air Force Times and its sister publications ran an online poll, and they asked the readers, are the history and traditions of your service important to you? Army, 83%, yes. Navy, 73%, yes. Marines, 91%, absolutely yes. <laughs> Air Force, 25% yes. Now you think about that for just a second, because that statistic scares the hell out of me. Because you are not new, you are not starting this business. And what this Air Force is today and will be tomorrow when you're leading it is based on where we came from and who the leaders were that got it going. We're not doing anything new today from what we did in the Army Air Corps days. We're just doing it better with newer technology and smarter, better trained people. Where we came from is critical to our, to our future. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Because your heritage isn't Billy Mitchell solely. If you think Billy Mitchell and the guys who went and bombed the Osfriesel and were doing anything more than betting quarters on who could put the first bomb down the smokestack, you're probably wrong. Those guys flying those bombers weren't thinking, boy, this is great Air Force heritage in the making. They weren't doing that. And you're going to be doing stuff in two or three years that is Air Force heritage in the making, but you're not going to be thinking of it that way either. So I'm going to tell you about some people today who are your heritage. I'd like you to pay attention while I do. Nine years ago this week, two of the squadrons from Hill Air Force Base, where I was stationed at the time, deployed to Operation Desert Shield in August of 1990. Colonel Tom Rackley, who some of you probably know, who's the Director of Plans and Programs here, went with him. I stayed home. I was the Operations Officer of the 34th Fighter Squadron at Hill, and I didn't get to deploy until about a month and a half later when I was sent over to take command of the 4th Fighter Squadron in the desert. By that time, Colonel Rackley had taken command of the 421st Squadron, and we shared a hooch during the war. By the way, he's a great American and a fighter pilot's fighter pilot if you ever want to talk to somebody who knows about combat and about leadership. He's a great guy to turn to. But what's significant about that is over the years I've been asked to talk about Desert Storm. And not long ago I was asked to give a presentation on my personal lessons learned from my experience in combat. That was pretty nifty, wasn't it? <laughs> We've got all kinds of sound effects we can use here. When I went to put this list together, I sat down and I spent about an hour and a half making this list. And I kept thinking and thinking and thinking, what can I put on there? Great lessons learned I want to pass on to future generations. And when I finished, I had about 15 items, just one little item is about that long, and I realized that none of them were lessons learned. Not one of them. Every one of them was a person, or an event, or just a feeling I had that I've never forgotten and never will. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. It's important before I start for you to remember that combat, any kind of combat, is different for everybody. You know, an aerial combat happens at about 1,000 miles an hour of closure. It's hot fire, cold steel, it's instant death, big destruction. It happens like this and then it's over. Ground combat's not that way, as you can imagine. And those of you who've heard infantry soldiers talk about it know that it's kind of endless time and soaking fear, and big noises and darkness. It's a different game, and you need different training to do it, and different types of people to handle it well, and to provide leadership in that environment. So it's different. But it doesn't matter how many people you have standing beside you in the trench, or how many people you have flying beside you in the formation, combat, especially your first combat, is an intensely personal experience. And so during the course of this Commandant's Leadership Series over this year, you're going to hear different people give different opinions and different perspectives. Today, I'll tell you the things I remember. First, 